So now you're retired. What are you going to do now? Well, stay tuned because we'll find out a way that maybe you can do something useful. Hi, welcome to WordNet. Thanks for joining us today. Those of you out there who are in retirement years and are looking for things to do might be interested to meet our guest today, Suzanne Devaney. She taught in Catholic schools, elementary schools for her career, and then went on to some other interesting things. Suzanne, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. You know, when I think back on my own experience in Catholic schools in elementary school and learning respect from the nuns, almost fear sometimes, I'm sure that no one was afraid of you. You seem such a warm and, and loving person. Tell us how you first decided to uh, enter the sisterhood and then to teach. I think I was in first grade and I saw these pictures of the Blessed Mother on the wall, and I just said, oh, I want to be, belong to God. Yeah, in first grade, and I never forgot it after that. No kidding. Yeah. And where did you get your training? I was at Notre Dame Academy in Los Angeles, and then uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame in Thousand Oaks. In those days, they were out in Hidden Valley and with, with the cows all around them. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Did you have chores on the farm as well as? <laughs> no, there weren't farm there, but, um, it, the, the cows were out in the pastures. We were separated from that. Yes. How, how pastoral that was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 19 years as a, as a teaching nun and then a principal. And then you retire. You, you leave the, the uh, sisterhood. And what did you do then? So many things after retirement. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine was saying you should write a book. Um, how to have zest in retirement, yeah, because um, I got involved in square dancing, and I, I'm a docent at the Christ Cathedral in Orange. It's, um, it's a tour guide, and uh, there's so many developments. Uh, I started that in 2012, and over these years, there have been so many developments uh, in Christ Cathedral that now it's open on weekends for masses. Well, we have uh, something in common. As a graduate student at Catholic University uh, and in the Army at the same time, I had an opportunity to work as a tour guide in the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Oh, it's beautiful. And I do remember that it at that time was not quite finished. The Knights of Columbus raised a lot of money to finish the steeple and the bell tower. Mm. And I had some wonderful experiences there. Um, what exactly does the docent do? You, you guide, you take people around, and what do you talk about? What are they interested in seeing? We get people from all over the world. So um, it had been Crystal Cathedral, and it was a destination internationally, and now it's Christ Cathedral. We have people from Colombia and Africa, <coughs> and a lot of people from Europe all over the world. So our job is to pre present a welcoming spirit. It's a place for Christ forever. You know, it's a place where everybody's welcome. It, it's become, like our, our uh, cemetery is, uh, it, it is open to all faiths. And uh, so it's become an ecumenical cemetery. So all faiths come and our job is to make sure people feel welcome. I yes. recall uh, going to one of the spectacular Christmas presentations when uh, it was connected with uh, Chapman University, I think. Dr. And, Schuler. And Dr. Yes. Schuler as well. Uh -huh. uh, great speaker. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, just uh, captivating and, and one of the One of his hallmarks was to set a tone of welcoming. And that's one of the things we're also there for, to set a tone of welcoming, continuing his spirit as well. Yes. How many parishioners would you say the, the cathedral There are over 10,000 parishioners. It's a parish and it's a, dioce a diocese. So they're separate buildings. The parish buildings are in the, the offices are in the Tower of Hope. The, and uh, the, the, um, the masses have been 
in the Arboretum for all these years, and now the, the cathedral has actually opened, and the Sunday and weekend masses are in there. And um, there are, were 10,000 people at uh, St. Callistus down the street. You go down Lewis to Garden Grove Boulevard, and there were 10,000 parishioners there, and a school and ministries, youth ministries and everything. So those two parishes switched places, Dr. Schuler's grandson and Christ uh, Cathedral, future Christ Cathedral group. They changed their name from St. Callistus switched places to the new building and became Christ Cathedral. And the process of becoming Christ Cathedral Parish was um, a gradual process and, the, and a deliberate process. So it became, uh, and there were 10,000 parishioners. I'm sure there are more now, probably 12,000, because they could fill that arboretum 12 times with masses. And now the masses fill the actual Christ Cathedral. Um, we moved in there in July, and uh, it seats 2,300. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot so, of people. Right. Is the construction still going on? Is it finished yet? The construction is finished. <clears throat> it took forever, like m a couple of years. The first thing they had to do was redo the windows. There are 11,000 windows that are really the walls. There are no walls in the structure. This was designed by Philip Johnson in 1980, and um, this was the first building built without walls in the United States. He became a very f f uh, famous architect because of that. So they had to go back and recoat all the walls, treat them, and reframe them because the birds had been eating the putty. <laughs> but the problem is not uh, the I said walls, I mean windows. But the problem is. The ceiling is made out of windows too, so the roof you can't uh, you can't go and step on the roof to fix the windows. You know you have to actually get in a crane, hang out there, and and, and the, one of the reasons they needed to do the windows was because the big big project of re, uh, of reconstruction was the air conditioning. Uh -huh. In 1980, when it was completed. There was no need for air conditioning. Garden Grove wasn't as, as hot as it is now. And there were uh, windows that opened and doors that opened, so they had a cross breeze. The birds would come in, and they'd <laughs> settle in the pipes, and they'd make their nests in the pipes. So now we needed air conditioning, but <clears throat> they had to re-coat re um, all the windows to cool the place down. And on top of that, the architects have designed these, what they call quatrefoils. They're these huge, they're really, they look like little petals on the ceiling, but they're really 10 feet wide. And they're set in such a way that the heat is reflected out and the UV rays reflected out and the light is reflected in. They're like, they're like um, screens, they're 10 foot wide and they look like petals and they're tilted every which way they studied the, um, the way the sun comes in and the heat comes in, and they reflect that out. So now, um, when people come from all over the world, that I would imagine that there is some spectacular responses to, to seeing this, particularly people who come from Europe when the cathedrals are old and um, the architecture is familiar in, in pictures, and this must be a spectacular view for people coming to see a modern place like this. Very spectacular. 11,000 uh, windows. Oh my goodness. I would not want to be a window washer <laughs> right. at the Crystal. <laughs> um, now you split your time a couple of times a month to your the cathedral. And other times you uh, take your camera, you're a photographer, and you have, I'm sure, we'll see some of your work uh, somewhere <laughs> soon, probably on the show today. Um, how did you get interested in photography? I think the, uh, I think traveling probably got, in the beginning I was using uh, throwaway cameras and then blowing them up and framing them mm -hmm. of the pictures. But uh, more recently, the, the ease of the iPhone has really helped a lot in, uh, and, and um, the inexpensiveness of the, the iPhone and the 
production and everything. It's very inexpensive and very uh, beautiful. It's uplifting. Have you had phot photography shows where your work is? Not yet. <laughs> You're looking forward to it, I'm sure. <laughs> now, I understand that in the cathedral, there are uh, places where artwork is, is hung. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, right now we have a display of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. <clears throat> now, this is a separate company that goes around and travels. Um, so it's not, we don't own that display, but people are coming from all over to see this beautiful uh, explanation of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And what they do is uh, they uh, take each individual that's painted on there and enlarge it about 12 feet. And then they have headphones and they tell you the biblical background for that and um, how he painted it and what, what, uh, why this figure was included and all that. This is every day you, this is available? This is every day and it's going to be extended until August. It's been there for a while. People are coming from all over to see that. Um, tell me more about your own personal photography. What is the, 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 the subjects that you are most interested in? Large um, landscapes. Uh huh. Um, I had the privilege in uh, Costa Rica, Rica recently. I belong to um, <clears throat> the lifelong learning program at um, Cal State Fullerton. Right. It's a it's classes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have traveled to do photography specifically. Yeah. Tell us about that. So um, at Cal State Fullerton, long uh, Cal State Fullerton. Lifelong Learning Program. Uh, there are lots and lots of classes, and I take classes there. And they set up um, uh, tours, and we went to Costa Rica as a group. And um, I got, and, and they went around asking uh, everybody what they wanted to get out of the program. So we were a group of 30 of us went all the way around. And when they got to me, I said, I want to get my Christmas card picture here. <laughs> Oh, I yeah. We had the privilege of being in the rainforest, no cars, nothing, and all, all boats, all water. And we eventually got uh, out to the uh, Caribbean. We were able to put our foot in the Caribbean. No kidding. A boat ride down in Costa Rica. What place that you went to to photograph stands out in your mind? Giverny Gardens in uh, France. Yes. Monet's Gardens, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, it happened to be a time of the year. Um, I think we went in June, early June, and it happened to be a time of the year that was everything was in bloom, and the water lilies and the the uh, the opportunity for photography was spectacular. I imagine it was. Of course, Monet is very famous for the water lilies photographs. Well, we're going to be back in a few minutes. We're going to take a break now. Do you want to fall in love with God? I'm sure we all want to. The book of Psalms contains the directions. Thousands of years ago, people like you and me talked to God out of the depths of their hearts, revealing an intimate love. Psalms are the expression of the faith in God by people around 3,000 years ago. God was not a mere abstract creator, but was present involved, and a real person of power and emotions. Now, when we read or listen to the Psalms, we can know the intensity of this love. Entering into the influence of the Psalms, we can find a path to know and love God. To know more about the Psalms, you should get a copy of Father Mike Manning's booklet, The Psalms. It will help you to understand the 150 Psalms better as he has categorized them. He uses the technique of acts, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. Get your copy today and know the categories. Learn to pray with the Psalms. Call the number on the screen or email us. You can also get it through our website. Get your copy today. Welcome back. Suzanne Devaney, Devaney is, one, is our guest today. And I have hardly ever in my life met a woman who does so much <laughs> and keeps on doing after retirement. 
<laughs> it's great to be back with you. When uh, we had our little break, uh, you told me a few things that just knocked me almost out of my chair. <laughs> you take piano lessons. You take Spanish lessons. You run a Bible study from your kitchen table. Um, you go to life learning uh, classes at uh, the local university and they have 150 choices. I bet you're taking them all. How do you keep up with all the stuff that you do? Where do you get the energy? Oh, you get energy from square dancing. That's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. Every, uh, every night of square dancing is 5,000 steps. Are you kidding? No, that's what you, and the music and have, have interacting with people, the social, oh, it's so life-giving. What is that maximum about walk 2,000 steps, 5,000 steps a day? I'm not sure what the number is, but square dancing, I bet would fit into that perfectly. Oh, beautifully. Yeah. I do recall that at the YMCA when I was a young man, we had uh, some square dancing opportunities. Not so much classes, uh, but actual square dancing and the uh, caller would show some things. And we had a thing called uh, dig duck for the oysters, dig for the clams. <laughs> and that was a kind of over and under with hands going down. <laughs> and uh, do -si do Alaman uh, left, Alaman right. I've forgotten most of that stuff, but it was such great fun it is. because learners would be trying to catch up with the people who had experienced <laughs> really and five thousand plus steps. That's amazing, just amazing. Now you take a piano class. So you take your own little uh, portable piano to class. That's right. This is for retired people at Cal State Fullerton Lifelong Learning Program. So we have our own rooms the retired people and all of the teachers are volunteers and we bring our little keyboard in with us and uh, they're about 15, 12 in the class and take the keyboard out yeah so what was the first song you learned oh i think it was um from this valley oh red river valley or something like from that from this valley they say we are leaving yeah yeah habla usted español señora no. not, not yet, yet. <laughs> I was uh, in college in my freshman year, and I took uh, Spanish because there was a language requirement for my degree. And oh, I suffered terribly through Spanish. But now living in California, es imposible a vivir en California y no habla un poquito español. I hope I said that right. I don't want to be embarrassed. Well, it helps to know a few things because we have visitors from Mexico, we have visitors from uh, South America. And the most important thing as docents that we're called to do is to make people feel welcomed and make them know that this is a place for everybody, that this is, this is the home in California where you can go and be welcomed. So w we do learn a few words so that people can, uh, or at least I did, I learned a few words so that people can feel that they are welcomed. I have a good ear for language, and through the years I've tried to uh, learn hello, goodbye, thank you in a number of different languages. And I find out that they come right back at me with <laughs> something and I don't know what they're talking about. But uh, I know that it's appreciated that uh, you would take time to learn a tiny bit. My next project is to learn a little bit of Navajo. Oh. because I expect to be presenting care packages to some of the last Navajo code talkers from mm. World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm interested to learn how to say hello, what my name is. I'm here to pay you tribute mm. in Navajo. Mm. That's going to be exciting to, be, to learn that. Yeah. Um, you also told me about the, the Bible study at your home. How many people would, will come? We have 10 people around my kitchen table, and you know, that when I first thought about 10 around my kitchen table, I thought, impossible. So when we got up to eight, I said, do you want to move to the living room? No, no, no. When we got to nine, no, no, no. So we have coffee and, and some really delicious treats every, every morning. First, we go to Mass at St. Anthony Claret in Anaheim, all of us. And then we come back and we go to, when we uh, discuss the readings for the next Sunday. And we also share our own spirituality so that 
we pray for people and for uh, for somebody who has lost somebody in their family or anybody needs anything. But 10 people fit around the table. I don't know how it works, but it works. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah. A crowded cabin at, at best. Um, That's the highlight of the week because it gives us the spirituality to carry on. And I feel like my house is blessed by the, these wonderful people. They're I'm sure all that's true. parishioners at St. Anthony Claret. I was uh, interested to, uh, <laughs> to learn about some of the people that uh, had been students at St. Cecilia's in Tustin, where you were principal yes, and teacher. Well, years. That um, <clears throat> a sense of pride that a number of those students went on to academic uh, success in other places. Tell me a little bit about your theory of discipline in a, <laughs> as a principal. I know what it was in my school and... Oh, it's different. <laughs> well, you know, you talk to people who had been to elementary school or even a little, maybe middle, middle school in Catholic schools with nuns, uh, with the ruler. I heard about a guy that was hit by the ruler so many times that he can still measure things on the back of his hand. But I never experienced anything like that. Neither did I as a child. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about well, we had that, those wonderful, things. wonderful teachers. That's the key to have. If your teachers are wonderful and they're happy, that's the key because if they're happy, the students are happy. They don't need to uh, have a lot of discipline. If a teacher is clear about boundaries and uh, with love and creates boundaries for her class, there's hardly much need for discipline. Now. Were they uh, re religious teaching at St. Cecilia's at that time? No, but they started it. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange started that school. Uh -huh. they, used to, to, um, they used to be there, but um, not at that time, no. And when I w moved to my current parish in 1974, the, sister, the Immac Immaculate Heart Sisters were there. Oh. And I was later um, privileged to meet Sister... Carita, famous yes. nun artist, mm -hmm. and um, her work is, you know, known all over the world. And I understand that she was an associate of one of the painters who has stuff hanging at the cathedral. She was teaching, um, and uh, John August Swanson was in her class, and he was um, he was studying uh, printing, but it's a different kind of printing, you know. But he went from there. And he went to Arizona and picked up uh, a lot of the uh, early American uh, beautiful, beautiful art. And his art is at our cathedral in a special chapel that's dedicated to the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. And he allowed uh, us to actually make an entire wall of Jesus washing the feet that he painted. His colors are real bright, and he was a student of Sister Carita. Yes. It may be interesting to hear that Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet taught me in elementary school. Wow. And I remember one day Sister Giovanna, sixth grade, said, John, you'll have to stay after school today. For some offense, I can't remember. And then Sister Redemptor came in shortly after I started my penance. And she had a little conversation with Sister Giovanna. And she came over to me and she said, John, I've been talking to sister and we've decided to let you go early. Apparently they had some appointment they'd forgotten. <laughs> and so she said, now I want you to say three Hail Marys every day to make sure that you're a good boy. And I did that and still continue to oh, do that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, we're getting close to the end of our uh, interview today, but... Um, I'd like to ask you, and I'm afraid to do this, what's next that you're going to pick up? Oh, oh, the world is open. You know, there's a lot of <clears throat> opportunities at Cal State Fullerton Lifelong Learning Program. There are lots of opportunities. I'm looking into the ukulele. <laughs> Ever since I learn to play the ukulele something good's come over me a song i wrote i don't know just out of one day i was at the piano 
But uh, and travel uh, opportunities. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, anybody else in your family that's retired that you're close to that's oh, doing yes. this sort of stuff? Oh yes, both my brother and my sister are oh. very, very active. It's been fantastic. This visit today is going to stand in the top ten of the shows that I've been able to do. I'm going to say a little prayer now. Uh, Lord, thank you very much for allowing us to hear what Suzanne has to say, uh, which should be an encouragement to many people who are out there in the retirement years, getting bored, want to do something wholesome and um, interesting. And she stands as a perfect example for how you can enjoy those later years in life. I want to thank our audience today for watching. Those of you who support this ministry, especially, we have some people in our studios today who've come by to encourage us. And I just feel privileged to be part of all of this. So Suzanne, when you leave today, uh, give me your address and I'll write down a bunch of things I want you to learn before the next time <laughs> I see you. <laughs> and I would love to have a, a conversation with you about getting into square dancing again. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. Do you want to fall in love with God? I'm sure we all want to. The book of Psalms contains the directions. Thousands of years ago, people like you and me talked to God out of the depths of their hearts, revealing an intimate love. Psalms are the expression of the faith in God by people around 3,000 years ago. God was not a mere abstract creator, but was present involved, and a real person of power and emotions. Now when we read or listen to the Psalms, we can know the intensity of this love. Entering into the influence of the Psalms, we can find a path to know and love God. To know more about the Psalms, you should get a copy of Father Mike Manning's booklet, The Psalms. It will help you to understand the 150 Psalms better as he has categorized them. He uses the technique of acts, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. Get your copy today and know the categories. Learn to pray with the Psalms. Call the number on the screen or email us. You can also get it through our website. Get your copy today.